Prescott Valley Christians. Now, I know that we don't have all the Christians of Prescott Valley gathered together here in our building, but it is important that we understand um, why this church is here. And, you know, I, if the word gets out, I'll, you know, the, the whole point we're trying to do is trying to gather more people. And, you know, Prescott Valley has a lot of people who are saved. There's a lot of people we run into out soul winning that are believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I want to preach a message that's a call. And also just to make sure that we're all on board and we understand the goal and the motivation and what this church, why we're here, what this church is all about, and what we're trying to do. Because we're a church that's not content with just showing up once a week, enjoying some fellowship and some time together with one another, which is all great, and then going home and then doing nothing for the Lord and then coming back week after week after week and just doing the same thing. That is not what, what we're about, and that's not what church is supposed to be all about. And people have commented in the past, especially when we first started the church, you know, why are you starting a church here? You know, Prescott Valley has so many churches, there, and there are. There are churches all over the place. And there are churches where people who are actually saved are attending, because we run it, like I said, we run into people who are believers. They have a testimony that Jesus Christ is their Savior, and they know that it's eternal. They know they can't lose it. They are saved, sealed, secure. They're saved. Amen. But the reason why we start our church here is because no one seems to be doing the works. And the works, especially of the first time. Look at We started in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 has warnings unto churches. We, know, we all know the book of Revelation is full of, of prophecy and future events, but the first few chapters is not about the future events. It's about things that were happening in the time of John. When John saw his visions, he was given instruction to write unto specific churches that were around at his time. Now, the reason why this is in Scripture is because there's nothing new under the sun, and the direction and the instructions that are given to these various churches apply today. That we need to make sure, as a church, whatever church we attend is, is not going to be going off into any of these areas that are being described here. You know, uh, there's things that are given that are being, churches are being praised for, and then there's many other things that are being given that need to be fixed, that need to be changed within the church. And we're going to start off with, with the church of Ephesus here at the very beginning of chapter 2. Let's look down and reread what it says here. Verse number 1 of chapter 2, the Bible says, Under the church, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks, again, the Bible is talking about these are churches. And Jesus is walking in the midst. Okay, these are his churches. And he's, and he's looking at them and reviewing them and analyzing them. Verse number two. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. All good things, right? Works, labor, patience. Good. Is this, a, is this a church that's working? Yeah, they're doing some type of work. They're laboring. He says, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Is that, that's another good thing. Amen. A church that actually doesn't bear, doesn't tolerate evil and wickedness. Amen. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So they're not just accepting of everyone. They're, when someone comes in and they want to teach and they want to preach and say, oh, I'm an apostle, they're actually testing them. They know the scripture. They, they're testing them to see are you of God or not? And they're finding people who are liars. They're finding people trying to creep in. They're, try, they're finding out people who are trying to bring in damnable heresies. So all of these things that we're seeing are good things being mentioned to, about this church. Verse number three, it has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. 
So he's saying you guys are working, you hate the evil, you know, you're you're you've got patience, you're you're doing you're doing a lot of stuff, but what you've forgotten, what you've left out is your first love. The first works, the first love. What comes first? The first love, the first thing that we need to have primary in our life is reaching the lost. Going out and preaching the gospel and reaching people who are not saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is primary in the Christian life and it should be primary in churches today. What happens is people, you know, churches, they start off right. They're excited. They get started off. They're on fire. They say, we need to reach people with the gospel of Christ. We need to go out sowing. We need to get people saved. And they go out and start doing this. And as the church grows, because you know, God blesses them and they're doing the works and everything's going well, what happens is they start changing. They're, they're you know, adding more things. Now, adding things isn't always a bad thing. It could be very good. You could be adding on to what you're already doing. And, and, you know, maybe even reaching more people in various ways. But what oftentimes will happen is that these extracurricular programs that kind of get added become more of the focal point of the church as opposed to winning souls, bringing the gospel to the lost. And they start changing their focus to all the programs that you can have internally. And church turns into more of a social club within the group than a mission-based church that wants to go out and reach the lost. Because that is the goal, is to, is to reach more people. I mean, that is the point. That's a point. Once you get saved, the, the goal and the point is to reach other people with the gospel. What good is it going to do anybody for you just to be saved and never to tell anyone else about it. What are you really accomplishing with your life if you never help anyone else come to Christ? You might work on getting sent out of your life, and, and amen, you should do that. You should do a lot of things. You come to church, you read your Bible, you can study, you do all kinds of stuff, and all kinds of labor, and all kinds of work. But at the end of the day, when you look back on your life, what do you really accomplish? Is it all just about yourself? Or can you say, I really went and helped others? And there's work that can be done here. You know, maybe There's a lot of churches that do work, and you know, I've heard about their missionaries, and they go out to these countries, and they build homes, and they build hospitals, and they build schools, and that's their missionary work. And I think in, in some of these churches, it actually started off Right and correct is that we need to get people the gospel. And then it turns into, well, we're going to send people and we're going to build these schools and we're going to dig wells and we're going to do all this stuff. So they're laboring. And the labor that they're doing isn't bad labor, right? It's benefiting people physically. It's benefiting them in the flesh. You may be feeding some mouths. But what good what good is the school? What good is the well? What good are these homes and these buildings if those people's souls spend an eternity in hell? Because you spent all of your time focused on all the things of this world and just the physical things and not giving the gospel and not preaching the truth. What good is it? Now, I'm not saying you can only have one or the other. I'm not saying you, you shouldn't go and build the buildings. The problem comes in when that's what you're all about. When you've left off the first love, when you remove the first works, then you have a problem. Then you have something lacking. Let's keep reading here in Revelation chapter 2 because basically this is what's happening in this church at Ephesus. They're doing works. They're doing good things. They have a lot of good attributes as a church. It's a solid church, but they've left off the first love. Verse number five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent 
and do the first works or else. Yes, there is an or else. Jesus is looking at churches today, legitimate churches, and I'm not talking about total apostates that of people that aren't even saved, that have no salvation because they don't they don't understand the gospel. We're talking about churches where people are saved. There's believers. And you know what? There's a few of them at least in town here. Because we run into them. I mean, there's a lot of people out there saved that go to church. And they're going to churches where there's a bunch of, of believers congregating together. That's a church. But the warning is in Scripture, hey, get right, repent, or else. There is, there is a, um, a judgment. There is a consequence to not running a church the way that Jesus Christ wants us to run this church. He says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. What's he saying? You will cease to be a church in his eyes. He will stop using you. He will stop working with that church because why? You're not even a candlestick anymore. This is an important admonishment, and this is one of the reasons why this church exists. There's too many churches, and I, and I can say this pretty comfortably and pretty confidently, even though I haven't gone and visited every church, I haven't talked to every pastor, I haven't looked up every outreach program or everything that they're doing. But I know this, I've lived here for four years now. Four years. In those four years, our tiny church has knocked virtually every single door in Prescott Valley. Four years, very small number of people going out and getting a work done, and I have not had one person knock on my door, approach me out in public, or anywhere trying to give me the gospel. You say, oh, you're the pastor, why would they try to give you the gospel? Because they don't know that I'm the pastor when they go to my house or when you see me out in the street. No one's going to know that. People don't know who I am. But it's not happening. Well, now, now, I know for a fact there are plenty of people out in this area that can say, oh yeah, someone from Word of Truth Baptist Church talked to me. Someone from Word of Truth Baptist Church tried to see if I was saved. Someone from Word of Truth Baptist Church tried to do these things. They tried to give me the gospel. That's a fact. But there's no other church that I'm aware of that's, that is doing anything like that. And they need to repent. They need to be zealous. And look, this is why we're here. This is what's so important. And people need to wake up and get right with God and decide, I'm not going to let my life pass me by without really doing anything for the Lord. As I mentioned, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. There are a lot of people here in this town that are run into and they're saved. And I praise God for that. Actually, it's one of the things I really like about this town. I really like about this area. Now, we know that it's still the minority. You know, when I say a lot of people I run into are saved, I'm comparing that to all of my other experience out knocking on doors and preaching the gospel in other parts of Arizona or in Illinois or anywhere I've been going out and knocking on doors. There seems to be a higher percentage, but it's not the majority by any means. The Bible, and, and the Bible's very clear about this. Matthew 7, verse 13 says, you're turning to Matthew 5. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Few. Are there many that are saved, Lord? No. It's few. There are not many. It's, it's the smaller number. It's the minority. Now, that actually goes hand in hand. I didn't have this as a point that I was going to make, but I think one of the reasons why so many people get lazy in these churches and don't feel the need to go out and preach the gospel 
is because they have a false perception of who's saved and who isn't saved. Just like I did. When I first got saved at 20 years old, I kind of felt like I joined this club. I mean, yeah, my whole life I was going to a Christian church. But I never felt like I was part of that because it wasn't my faith. I just went because I had to go because that's how I was brought up. I showed up to church. But it wasn't what I believed. Once I put my faith in Christ, like, wow, yeah, I'm a believer. And, and in my head, I'm thinking, all of these churches that are called Christian, now, they're all saved. They're all believe, they all believe in Christ. You know, they're, they're, This is what I thought. Obviously, I knew there's some really weirdos out there, you know, the cults that are, that are just really far removed. But overall, I just kind of thought that, well, you know, you know, they're all Christians. And I kind of felt like I was just part of this greater Christian movement. It wasn't until a little bit of study and, and actually really getting into a good church that I realized how far off people really are that call themselves Christians. And it's kind of funny that I had this idea that, oh, I thought all of these other people were saved and Christians when I myself was part of a church that was going regularly and wasn't saved and wasn't part of, of, of that group of what I thought people were saved. I just, had, I just didn't look at other people the way that I was. But the way that I was is actually probably the way that the majority of people are that show up to various churches that maybe they're well-intended. I wasn't ill-intended. I wasn't looking to do evil. I wasn't just looking to live in you know, this, this wicked, sinful life or anything like that. I just I didn't understand the gospel. That's the bottom line. I just didn't understand the gospel. I didn't know what it meant. I heard about Jesus. I heard about how he died for our sins. I heard all these different things. But I didn't understand it. I didn't understand that... that He's the Savior, and that you need to put your trust in Him. You need to rely only on Him, completely on what He did. Stop trusting your own works, and that you put your faith in Him, and He gives you a gift of eternal life that lasts forever, and you can never lose that. You can't screw it up, and no matter what you do later, once you're born into God's family, you're born again, you're saved. Amen. I didn't understand that concept. It's a simple concept. It's very easy. It's not difficult, but I didn't get it. And it wasn't until... I got it and received it and believed that I was saved. Obviously, now there's a lot of people out there, though, in churches that they don't understand. They don't get it. And the more that you go out with us and the more you talk to people and go out and preach the gospel, the more you'll realize that just because someone says they're a Christian or someone says they go to a Christian church doesn't mean that they're saved. You have to ask the questions. You have to find out what they truly believe, what they truly trust. And the more you do that, I guarantee you'll start to see more clearly that there are a lot of people that maybe you thought were all okay and all going to heaven that really aren't. Right. And I think that's probably the number one reason why well-meaning believers that are going to various churches don't feel the need to go out and preach the gospel, especially in a town like this. Because there are quite a few believers. Because this isn't some extremely liberal place where people just hate God and are trying to do everything they can to fight against God. Overall, this is a relatively wholesome place. It's a pretty good place to live. So I think that gets people even more on their hunches. It gets people more just relaxed and laid back and do not feel a need to go out and do any work and actually reach people. Oh, well, the majority of people here are Christian. So why, what does it really matter? Because the majority of people are not Christian. There's a lot of people who are Christian in name only. There's a lot of people that are not saved and not believers. Now, the fact that there are quite a few believers here is great. There's some salt here. You're in Matthew chapter 5. You know, as long as there's salt here, at least we could, we could be... Thankful that we're not going to end up like Sodom anytime soon. Remember when God went to destroy Sodom, Abraham was, was 
pleading with them and saying, you know, Lord, if there's if there's 30 people, will you destroy it? He's like, nope, won't destroy it for 30. How about 20 people? He goes down to 10 people. He's like, if there's 10 people, 10 righteous people, will you destroy Sodom? And he says, no, I won't do it for 10. Now, we have a lot more than 10 saved people in Prescott Valley. So, I say, praise God, that's good, right? We, we're, we're, not, we're not way far removed like, you know, San Francisco, San Francisco or any, you know, these weird places. There's just tons and tons of sodomites that ate God and, and fewer and fewer people who are saved. But on the other hand, what good is the salt if it's lost its savor? Look at Matthew 5, verse number 13. The Bible says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. He's saying, you're the salt of the earth. We are here. What is salt used for? It's a preservative as well as a seasoning. Right? As believers, we're the salt of the earth. We need to preserve the good taste, the, good, the goodness from God. We need to be out here making sure that, hey, we're going we're gonna to keep things going. We're going to be reaching the next generation. We're going to keep people in line with God. We need to be that preserver. We need to be that salt. He illustrates it another way in verse number 14. He says, you're the light of the world. If you have Jesus Christ, who is the light, if you have Jesus in you because you're born again, you are the light of the world. This world is a dark place. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. What do you say? I mean, we see a lot of we see a lot of houses on hills out here, right? Around mountains and stuff. Now there may be other houses in valleys and in other areas behind mountains that you can't see at all when you're driving around. But you know what? That one that's up on top of the hill, you can see that one. Everybody sees that one. That can't you can't hide it. It's there for all to see, right? The city that's on top of the hill cannot be hid. It says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. The whole point of having a candle is to provide light. You don't light a candle to walk around in the dark and then cover it up. Right? Well, I still got the light. It's still there. Yes, it's still there. But it's not shining for anybody to see. It's not doing any good because you've completely muffled it. you silenced it. you covered it. It does no good. Neither men like candle put out a bushel about a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. It's not just for you. It's for the benefit of everybody that's in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is what Jesus is telling believers to do. You have a light that's been given to you and you need that light to shine. Other people need to know that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. They need to see your good works. They need to see not just the way that you live their life, but they need to know the source of that light. He said, I didn't give you this light for no reason. The light is given to you in order to shine. Don't cover it up. Don't muffle it. Don't silence it. Don't quench that spirit. You have to ask yourself, is your light shining? The light that God's given you as a believer, is it shining? What is it that you do to make that light shine? Look at verse number 17. Jesus said, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right after talking about letting your light shine, he goes into this concept of, well, hey, guess what? I'm not here to destroy the law. And he makes a very good point about this, and I think this is interesting, because the same churches that are not big on letting the light shine, 
and preaching the gospel to the lost are the same churches that have a tendency to say, we're free in grace. We're free from the law. Oh, that Old Testament law, that was for the Jews. That was for Israel thousands of years ago. But we don't have to worry about that. Everything's good. Hey, we have grace, so don't worry about it, man. They go hand in hand. But Jesus says, no, you need to let your light shine and don't think that I came to destroy the law. Because I didn't. He fulfills the law. But he says, until the law is fulfilled, there's not one jot or one till that's going to fail from the law. And he goes further to say, if you break one of the least commandments, you say, oh, well, God knows I'm a sinner. And people say, oh, you know, we're all sinners and, and it's not that big of a deal, right? This is the attitude and the culture that you get in many churches today. Why are you judging? Oh, why are you preaching on this stuff? It's not that big of a deal. If God said it, it's a big deal. Amen. If it's written down in God's word, it's a big deal. If it's, if it's important enough for God to add it to a law and said, you do not do this, it's a big deal. Which is why Jesus Christ himself said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, one of the smallest commandments, and shall teach men so. You say, oh yeah. I, I don't do that, and you don't have to do that either. But they're saying, he says, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. If you break the commandments and teach other people to break the commandments, but you're a believer, guess what? You're still saved. Guess what? You don't lose your salvation because of that. Jesus Christ himself said, you know, hey, did he say you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven? He says, no, you're going to be called least. You're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them. Teach the law? I thought we were free from the law. No, Jesus said, teach them. Do and teach. It's not just enough to do. Yeah, you ought to do. You ought to follow. You ought to get the sin out of your life and obey the commandments the best you can, but also teach them. Let your light shine. Teach the word of God. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was a radical. I think people don't, don't, don't understand this because of the, the warped perception that Hollywood has given them, that pictures have given them. People view Jesus Christ as being a total pacifist, as being someone who was just really soft and walked around in a dress and had his hair real long and wouldn't hurt a fly and, and would step around the ants so he didn't step on one. This is the view that people have of Jesus Christ today, and it's unfortunate because it's not who he is. Right. Yeah. What the Bible teaches that, that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Jesus Christ yeah. did not have long hair because Jesus Christ is not shame. He didn't walk around in a dress. The Bible says it's an abomination for a man to put on a woman's garment. And Jesus Christ was a radical. And we're going to see that here in Matthew chapter 5. As he brings up the law, which he didn't come to destroy out of his own mouth, he didn't come to destroy it. He actually takes things to a whole other level. He wants people to be his disciples and to be zealous like he was. If Jesus Christ wasn't a radical, why would people be so bent on destroying him? He was a radical. He was extreme. He was an extremist. He's a religious extremist. Why? Because everything had to be exactly right and true with Jesus Christ. And everything that he did. Because he was perfect. He was without sin. There is no compromise with the truth with Jesus. Right. And when you don't compromise, people call you an extremist. Well, okay. But he was right. Look at verse number 20. We'll see a little bit of the radical 
nature of Jesus Christ. Verse number 20, he says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Excuse me. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. What's he doing there? He's quoting the law. Not to kill. Right? And what is he doing now? Is it, does he say, yeah, but that was the Old Testament. And, you know, we've kind of relaxed on that a little bit. It's okay. You know, I understand you want to kill somebody. So it's not that big of a deal anymore. Is that what Jesus said? Oh, wait, no, that's not what he said. He says, but I say unto you, you heard it said not to kill. If you kill, you're in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, killing somebody and being angry with someone for no reason, are those exactly the same thing? No, which one's more strict? Being angry with someone with your brother without a cause. He's putting that level of restriction on it and saying, I'm taking things even further. I'm going to be more radical. I'm going to say, yeah, you've heard about killing, but you know what? If you are angry with your brother without a cause, and whosoever shall say to us, he says, shall be in danger of the judgment, which is the exact phrase he used about killing. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus Christ was not softening anything. Everyone wants to point to the woman taken in adultery and say, see, look, it's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal. Yeah. And I'm not going to get into all that. I've explained that many times in many other sermons, what they were trying to do to trick Jesus and to trap him in his words and try to get him to make a judgment where the uh, where basically they would have some more, a way to accuse Jesus of disobeying the Roman government and getting him into, uh, into trouble that way. But let's keep reading here, because this isn't the only area that, that he makes things more strict. Verse number 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave thy, there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him. Lest any, at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou cast, be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, that thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Now again, he's referencing the law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But it's not a big deal, right? I mean, didn't he let that woman go? Is it, well, you shouldn't, shouldn't commit adultery. Oh, but you did, but it's not a big deal. But I say unto you, so what is he going to say now? Okay, yeah, committing adultery is wicked, it's bad. But I'm going to take it a step further. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's saying it's not just enough to not commit adultery. He says you shouldn't even be looking at another woman and lusting after her in your mind and committing adultery in your heart. That's the level that Jesus takes things to. That's what he's saying, that we ought to be righteous in that regard, not just in the sense that, well, I didn't actually go and, and commit adultery with someone. Well, if you're doing it in your heart, he's like, you're committing adultery in your heart. And that's not right either. And then he goes on, verse 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Yes, those are the words of Jesus Christ saying that if you put away your wife and you divorce your wife, you're causing her to commit adultery. If it's for any other reason than the cause of fornication, he says you're causing her to commit adultery. If you marry her that's divorced, you're committing adultery. 
Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Those are not soft words. Those are not words that people want to hear today. People are calling you judgmental. People say, oh, why do you say those things? I say those things because Jesus said those things. And you've forgotten who Jesus is because you're not reading the Bible. Or you don't care about what he says. But we care about what Jesus says here. You won't hear this preached in the vast majority of churches that call themselves Christians today. Why? Because there's so many people that are divorced or divorced and remarried within their churches. And they don't want to offend people. They don't want to upset people with God's word. But I'm sorry, when you come to Word of Truth Baptist Church, be prepared to hear all the counsel of God. Why? Because I want to make you upset? No, because it's for your benefit. And it's for my kids' benefit and your kids' benefit to hear these things. Because it's the Word of God. Because we exalt God's Word above any other person. We're not a respecter of persons. If we censored or put a cover over our light for any reason, I mean, where are we going to stop Oh, well, there's a lot of people that are divorced from marriage, so maybe we shouldn't touch on that. Well, you know what? There's a lot of people that are sinners that have sinned in all manner of sin. Are we just not going to preach any sin out of the Bible now so we don't offend anybody and just cover that light and not let anyone know the truth? To just let them continue in sin and let people continue to make bad decisions and ruin their lives in many cases because they don't hear clear teaching on God's law? Not here. That's why we're here. We are here to be a light. We're here. Look, none of this stuff is new. None of this stuff is new. You know, oh, Word of Truth Baptist Church, we've got this, you know, this new look on things, or this new Christianity. No, it's not new at all. All we're doing is just opening this up and exposing it to people. Why? Because so many people have never even read it before. And we're just going to let it know and, and, and make it be plain that this is what the scripture says. So when you come to church here, sometimes you may walk away with a little bit of a wrench in your gut. But that's a good thing if what you're hearing is the truth from God's word and you're being convicted of something that you're not right with God about. It's good to have a godly sorrow. I don't preach these things because I like beating people up over sins they've committed. That's not the purpose. Uh -huh. The purpose is to get right. I don't discipline my children. I don't spank their ears because I enjoy inflicting pain upon them. I do it because I want them to do what's right. Now, obviously, we don't have paddles here. I'm not going to, don't worry about that. We're, we're not gonna, we don't have any punishments like that when you're in sin here. But you're going to hear from God's word. You're going to hear the truth. You're going to hear everything that God says. And you know what? That's between you and God, how you deal with that. But at least you're going to hear it. I will not cover this book. I will not put a, put a bushel over it. We're trying to be that city on the hill. We don't want to be hit. That's why everything that I preach goes online. As long as our equipment's working. We're live streaming right now. Why? Because we're not trying to hide anything. I think it's hysterical. I found this, there's this video someone put up of, uh, about, about me. And they're like, oh, see, Pastor Rosa, he's exposed here. And the, ex the, the expose that they did was from a video that I posted live on YouTube for everyone to hear about what I believe about a particular doctrine. Yeah, good job exposing me. I think I already did that for you. <laughs> Which is really funny. And, and that doctrine was on, on the, the fact, the fact that the Bible says that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. You are, oh, you believe Jesus Christ's soul went to hell? Yeah, because I believe Acts chapter 2. 
It's, that's, that's a big expose. Amen. <laughs> but look down at verse, at the, the, verse number 48, Matthew chapter 5, where we were. Look at what he says here. Because he goes on and on. Verse number 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be whole. He wants us to be complete in our Christian life. He wants us to look and have respect to God's law and to not just toe the line, not see how close we can get to sin without it maybe actually not being a sin, but understand the law and understand that, hey, if it says not to kill, you shouldn't even be angry with your brother without a cause. If it says not to commit adultery, you shouldn't even be looking at, at a woman to, to, to lust after in your heart. He said these, these, these commandments aren't given you to just be like, all right, you finally sinned. He's saying this is way more than that. You need to be looking at and understanding the law. Yes, not committing them, but having so much respect for them that you're going to stay really far away from coming close to anything resembling committing that type of infraction and breaking God's law in that way. He said for us to be perfect, not to make excuses when you don't like what the Bible says. I think this town has enough churches that want to pat you on the back and tickle your ears and tell you how great everything is, instead of telling you to pluck out your eye if it offends you. Right. That's the preaching of Jesus. He didn't go up to people and say, oh, it's okay, oh, Oh, you're lusting after other women? Let me give you a big hug. I understand. I'm a man too. That's not what Jesus said. He drew a line and said, You know what? I'm a man. And if you're lusting after a woman in your heart, you're committing adultery with her in your heart. And you know what the Bible says about adultery and how God feels about that. So... Get right. Be perfect. Now, does he know that nobody's perfect? Of course he knows that. But is he making excuses or saying it's okay? No. And way too many times, people get overly sympathetic to the point to where they're basically just saying... Oh, yeah, we're all sinners. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal. I'm really toning down the preaching on this stuff. Jesus ramped it up. Because that's what we need. We need a swift kick in the pants every once in a while. <laughs> we need to get right with God. We need to hear hard preaching and forceful preaching from God's word that's going to get us right and say, I'm not going to do that because the Bible says, Jesus says, this is wicked as hell and he wants me to be perfect. There are enough churches that want to welcome everyone and everything into the church. There's a church right up the street. Right up the street, a few blocks away. Everyone's welcome. And it's a pastor that's, a, that's a, a female pastor. When the Bible says it's not permitted for women to speak in church, but that they need to keep silent. But this is a female pastor that, that apparently doesn't have respect for what God's word says. No surprise when you don't respect what the Bible says you need to be the husband of one wife in order to be a bishop of a church. I don't think that lady is a husband of anybody. But when you don't respect that, you're not going to respect 1 Corinthians chapter 5 either that says, no, there's actually some people that you shouldn't be fellowshipping with at all, that you shouldn't even eat with. Which is why we're never going to say everybody's welcome here. Everyone's not welcome here. We draw a lot. There is just evil and wickedness that we are not going to allow to come into this. Now, we will go out to people. We will go out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will bring that light out into this dark world and preach that gospel every creature. We'll do that. But we're not going to bring all manner of wickedness into God's house. Not going to happen. 
We're not going to bring in the merchants to buy and sell and get gain in the house of God. We're not going to set up the coffee shop. We're not going to set up the bookstore. Why? Because when they did that in the temple, Jesus Christ flipped over their tables and drove them out with a whip. That's why. But it's for a good cause. Yeah, they were selling things for a good cause too, but Jesus said, not here. Not in this house. Go do that outside. You know, we have very interesting demographics in this town. The median age here is higher than the rest of the state, which makes sense. There's a lot of people that move to this area, to Prescott, Prescott Valley, and they come and retire here. And I can see why. I love this place. It's a great town. The, the, the temperature is pretty mild. We've got four seasons. It's not brutally hot like it is in Phoenix in the summertime, but it's not super freezing cold in the winter either. It's a great place to be. Small town, but it has everything that we need. It's, it's awesome. Well, I can't say anything more that's better about this place. It's a great place to live. But it's a fact, you know, that the median age here is higher. There's a lot of retirement age people living here. But also, this town is growing younger and younger. There are more people moving here. There's more families here. And the, the, the age is coming down as opposed to going up. And what started off more uh, more retirees here, now with the growth, that, that age is coming down because there's more, there's more people moving here that are, that are that have families and stuff. Now, we need this church. We need this church here or another church just like this church here because we have a younger generation that is getting nothing but lies and anti-Christian propaganda shoved down their throats on a daily basis. The attack is full force, especially on the youth. And I want to plead with the Christians, with the believers, especially in this town, especially those that might be a little bit older, to help us to get the youth in line. To give them the truth. To shine the light that if nothing else in this area, there's going to still be a normal place to live that's not as influenced by Satan and the things of this world. But that are hearing good, solid, fundamental truths and fundamental morals that are being eroded on a daily basis. And it is the, it is the job of the older generations to be able to stand and, and preach the truth that, and that hopefully should have the wisdom in order to teach and, and to not allow the younger generation to get carried off with doctrines of devils and get swept off into the world. Someone needs to stand in the gap. Someone needs to proclaim the truth. Someone needs to get out of the comfort of their home, get out of their social club of a church where you only ever talk to other believers and pat each other on the back on how good Christians you are and how you gave money to some charity or gave money to some cause. Get out of that environment and go out and actually do something. Go out and engage people. Go out and talk to people and shine that light of the gospel. That is what's really important. Your money doesn't replace your actions. Having good friends, and that's all you have, and you all communicate with each other, doesn't help anybody else. You're not going to help save the youth. You're not going to help save the next generation. When you hang out with each other, and the only thing that you're able to do is just give money to a cause. And notice I said the only thing. I'm not saying giving money to, to a cause or hanging out with a friend is bad things. But when you lose the first love, as Jesus said in, in Revelation chapter 2, you know, watch out because that candlestick's going to be with you. God is long suffering, and merciful, and will work with us and work with us. But there comes a point where he says, I'm done with you. 
And again, I'm not talking about our salvation. I'm talking about just who's he using as churches. There comes a point where it's just going to be like, fine, I'm done. I'm headed with you. We need to get on the front lines. Our children are worth it. The future is worth it. And even though Presque Valley is growing younger, there are still a lot of retirees here, as I mentioned. And what I would like, if I could speak to all the believers, especially those in the older generation in this town, did you get this far in your life just to fizzle out and die? Don't you have anything to offer the next generation? Or is your plan to just waste the rest of your life in leisure? Turn if you into Luke chapter 12. I think there is a huge potential, especially in the current place that we're at. If, if, if there was a way for a fire to be lit underneath some of the older people, but in this area, in this town, in this time, everything, because the older people that are alive today knew what it was like to grow up in a country that actually had decent morals. Of course it wasn't perfect. But the changes have happened so rapidly within my own lifetime of just extreme wickedness and this tolerance and acceptance of all the perversion and filth and stink of this world has just gotten out of control. There are people that are alive today that are probably dumbfounded with some of the things that are happening today. I mean, even just look at all the school shootings that are happening and how crazy is going. things are just going nuts. I mean, the world is self-destruction, is self-destructing, and it's insane. The older generation grew up in a time where you used to go to school with a gun rack in your truck, and no one had to worry about kids getting shot up. Why? Because they were raised properly. Because the problem is a moral and a spiritual problem. It's not a chemical imbalance problem. It's not an ADD problem. It's a moral decay problem. And if the people who know that way, who know the old way, who know the old path would not just sit on their rear and enjoy their retirement and just, just do everything else in the care of this world, but would actually step up and care about the next generation and say, you know what, this is not the way things should be. This is an abomination in the eyes of God, and this needs to stop. And you know what, okay, praise God, now I've got all the time in the world to help show other people that this is not the right way. What a great opportunity for those that don't have to go to work every single day to support a family, to support your, 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 your whole household, and still try to do all this work, to not have all those obligations to be able to invest more time reaching people and making a serious, significant difference in the lives of others. Look at Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at verse number 16. There's a parable that Jesus gave. Regarding retirement, it's exactly what this is talking about. Verse number 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So this guy is blessed. This guy ends up being blessed, and he's financially doing very well. Verse number 17, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Say, well, this is great. I'm getting all kinds of increase for my land. So what am I going to do about it? How, how am I going to deal with this? What should I, how should I handle this? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to store it all up. 
I'm going to pull down my barn, I'm going to pull down my silos, I'm going to build really big storage, and I'm going to store up everything that I'm accumulating here on the earth. Verse number 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Isn't this what the vast majority of people are working for? They're putting away their 401ks. They've got their IRAs. They've got their portfolio. They're accumulating all of this wealth. And I'm going to build up this big bank account so that way what I can do is stop working and I can just eat, drink, and be merry. And live a life of vanity. That's unfortunately the goal of so many people. But look at what, how Jesus ends this parable. Verse number 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool. I don't know about you, but I don't want God calling me a fool. What a waste. What an embarrassment. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, but get this, this is the important part, and is not rich toward God. As with almost everything I've been preaching this morning, there are things that you can do that are good. There are things that are not sin. There are things that are not bad. Even having a 401k or having the, you know, finances is not in and of itself a bad thing. It's not wicked. It's not sinful to have that. But he says, you're a fool if you're laying up all these treasures and that's your focus and you're not rich for God. And that your whole plan is just to have this money and to take it easy and enjoy life and you're not doing any work for God. You're not building anything for God. You're not laying up any treasure in heaven with God. You're a fool. And we have way too many fools in this town. Because you know what this attitude is? I don't care about anyone else but myself. That's it. And then we wonder why the morality of the country is going to hell. It's when we have an older generation that says, I don't care about anyone else but myself. Jump down to verse number 33. I was going to sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. A great blessing. That's where the focus needs to be. In all of our lives. Young, old, it, it really doesn't matter. Last place I want you to turn is John chapter 15. We're almost done. John chapter 15. Last place I want you to turn. John 15. There's one thing that's different about this church that hopefully people recognize that we are a church that focuses on shining the light of the gospel. 
You can tell from the map back there, you can see all the highlighted areas, and that's not even everything. That map is still not completely up to date. There's areas that don't even exist on that map that we've done. We've gone into Prescott, we've gone into Dewey. Now, those areas still have a lot more work to be done. But we're shining the light. We're winning souls to Christ. We're trying to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the goal. And, I, and I'm here to tell you, though, that this is not optional. Now, I don't believe that you have to come to this church to be right with God. I don't, I'm not, we're not like a weird cult that says only we have salvation, right? If you're not a member of this church and you're not saved or anything like that. But I, I will say this. Going out and, and winning souls to Christ is not optional for a believer. And if there is not another church that is sending people to go out and preach the gospel, as a believer, you ought to be in this one. Because we are sending people, because that is the first work. And we're going to make sure that our candlestick isn't removed. Because we will send you. I'm going to quote Romans 10 for you. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen and amen. amen. And anyone that has this doctrine and believes that ought to listen up because he goes on to explain how people get saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Obviously, in order to call on, on the Lord, you need to believe. And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? Can't believe in something you never heard about. And the, when you look at our, our soul winning numbers and you look at the people that we've led to Christ, the vast majority of the time, the people that we're talking to didn't hear, didn't understand. Yeah, they've heard different things about Jesus. They've heard some stuff. But I usually ask, hey, has anyone ever explained it to you? Like, has anyone ever really just broken it down and made it that simple? Like, it's just a free gift? You just have to, you know, like, no. They haven't heard. People go to church for years and decades right. and never hear right. because no one takes the time to open up the Bible and show them and explain how easy it is. <clears throat> and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That calling on the name of the Lord goes all the way back to people being sent to preach the gospel. Need to be said? When I got saved, I knew how to be saved. I call on the name of the Lord. I knew it was simple at that point when I finally received it and accepted it. I wanted to tell others about it. I started to a little bit. But I didn't really know what to do or what to say. It was kind of hard to explain. Didn't have a lot of good doctrine. Why? I was a baby. I was an infant in Christ. I, was, I didn't know much at all. Even with the, the, the years I spent in church, I really still didn't know that much at all because I was a newborn. I did not take it upon myself learn the Bible, and to go out and start winning souls to Christ. Didn't do it. Didn't do it until I got into a church that was, was sending people. Until I got into a church that was able to, to teach and to train and to disciple me to be able to go out and do this work. And look, this is, this is God's work. How shall they preach except they be sent? And when you get churches that aren't sending people out to preach the gospel so that people can hear, so that people can believe and call the name of the Lord, then you're not really doing a good work for God as far as getting people saved. And what is more important than a person's soul going to heaven? Is your house important? Your school is important? 
going to heaven. You're in John chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. This is, this is not optional as a believer. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Notice this. Every branch in me. Now, is this talking about branches that are not in Christ? No. It's a branch in Christ. So if you are in Christ, are you saved or not saved? saved. You're saved. This is talking about someone who's a believer, someone who is in Christ. Is every branch that's in me, but is not bearing fruit. So is it possible to be in Christ and not bear fruit? Yep. Yes, it is. Amen. So if you have a believer that's not bearing fruit, does that mean they're unsaved? No. no way. It just means they're not being fruitful. They're not doing what they ought to be doing. They're not working the way they ought to be working. They're not doing the things that God would have them to do. But it doesn't make them unsaved. It doesn't mean they're not in Christ. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So you're saying, you know what? You're a branch. You're in Christ. You're not bringing forth fruit. He says, we're just going to get you out of the way. You're cumbering. You're hindering things. Jesus Christ said, he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When he says there, he takes it away, that's not talking about losing your salvation. What I think it's talking about is losing your life. Taking you out of, the game, out of this game, out of, out of this world. He says, you know what? He's going to take you away. Or he's just going to toss you aside and, not, and you're not going to be used at all in any sense. He's just going to be done with you and you can live off your life or whatever. You know, that's, he says, he's going to take you away but every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, right? He's going to squeeze you. He's going to trim you with the goal of bringing forth more fruit. He likes that. He's going to invest his time on those that are bearing fruit. Maybe you're only bearing a little bit. That's fine. He'll, make, he'll, he'll, he'll work on you. He'll work on your branch to make you even more fruitful. Verse number three, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. We, don't, we can't bring forth fruit of ourselves. Right. It's not our power, it's not us. We need Christ in us to, to help us bring forth that fruit. Make no mistake about it, it's not our own power. So I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Not so shall ye be my believers. This is how you are his disciples. Jesus wants disciples. He wants people to follow him. He wants people to be fruitful. He wants people to work for him. And he says, that's how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. This is our purpose. This is the purpose of a believer. To bear much fruit. To glorify the Father. To glorify the Son. Not to kick your feet up and do nothing for the Lord with the rest of your life. We have a lot of potential in this town. I'm always trying to find ways to reach the people here because, especially because we have people that are, we have a lot of people that are saved. Where are they? They're getting their ears tickled. I mentioned before, they're, they're not going out and preaching the gospel, I'll tell you that much. I've yet to run into someone preaching the true gospel. Someone who's not a Jehovah's Witness. Right. Someone who's not a Mormon. Preaching salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Four years, I haven't come across.
cross one. Sad. This is why this church needs to be here, or a church like this church needs to be here. People here need to be reached. People here need to, to, to be discipled and to grow. And let's, let's, let's be the salt. Let's not lose our savor. As far as that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for saving our souls. Lord, I pray that you would please stir us up. Stir up our hearts and our minds. Help us to get our priorities right in this life. Lord, I think we can all probably say there's more that we can do for you. And I pray that you please help us to overcome whatever our stumbling blocks are that would be preventing us from doing more to serve you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please work in, in every individual here and help us to, to reach more people. God, I ask that, that you'd also just bring other believers that want to do more in, in, into contact with us and bring them here to, to do a work, Lord, and that, uh, that you, you'd work through us to, to glorify your name. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.